Okay. Hi. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us at the Fayetteville Public Library's Zoom presentation of Getting Into Genealogy. I am Amy, the genealogy librarian, and Mickey, our resident genealogist, is here with us also. We are glad you have joined us and would like you to know that there are other Zoom presentations um, that we will, um, that you can find on our web calendars. Sign up for, uh, get the Zoom link, and there's many programs and book clubs and all kinds of things you can find there. Joining us today is Amanda Bancroft. She is a writer, an artist, and a naturalist, and she loves her work. She designs greeting cards and writes nonfiction, various topics for magazines and newspapers. Her favorite hobby is watching wildlife, and she's frequently out in the woods or walking country roads, connecting with nature or participating in citizen science projects like Nest Watch or Frog Watch. She and her husband actually live at the historic Johnson Farm on Kessler Mountain in an off-grid tiny home. And here today to share with us about the Johnson Farm is Amanda. Thank you for joining us, Amanda, and it's all yours. Thank you both so much for having me. I'm really excited to share the Johnson Farm archives with you, and especially you, to share with you too personally is really amazing. And I also just wanted to thank everybody that's watching this video. If you have questions about some of the material or the history of the Johnson Farm or Reefs Chapel community or cemetery, or just in general, if you want to get in touch with me about any, any of this, um, please contact me through our Ripples website, which will be linked in the video description or our Facebook page. You could Facebook message me anytime. So thanks for joining us. And I guess I can get started. <laughs> um, I think if, if you want to pause the video at any time, you who are watching, um, if, if you want to see something longer or go back, uh, I think you can do that, right? Yeah, they should be able to. Great. And so this, this archive presentation is really going to be just a show and tell sampling of what we've got here at the Johnson Farm Archive. So it's not going to be um, from the same location or all about the same family. But uh, we'll, we'll be doing things like from New York and Missouri, and Arkansas, and all over the world. And I wanted to give you a selection of not just photographs, but also letters, diaries, um, artifacts, memorabilia, and various things to share. So um, if you want to, however, if you want to know the chronological history of the Johnson Farm and, and the pioneer community here, Reese Chapel community, that former community, then you can read about it at the library in the flashback with their wonderful, wonderful flashback journals by the Washington County Historical Society. Um, I wrote an article about the farm. I had this wonderful opportunity to write this, this article and it was divided up into two parts. And so you can, you can read the first part in the winter 2018 flashback and the second part in the spring 2019 flashback. I don't know, maybe do you wanna mention when that might be available for people watching. Yeah, um, so hopefully when we reach uh, stage three or um, they also say, or I think it's phase three or stage five in um, the COVID uh, preparations, <laughs> then we should be able to uh, let you have more time in the library, which would mean that you could actually sit at the tables and browse the collection and um, or sit at the computers and research your family. Mm -hmm. And uh, that you will just, um, if you wanna call us or just keep it checking our website, that'll probably be the first place it'll be. So uh, look forward to being able to host you there as soon as possible. I miss the library so much. I miss you both too. I miss seeing Mickey and talking to you. I miss you, sweetheart. Thank you. Thank you for all this. Sure. You're wonderful. Thanks Absolutely. for inviting me to do this. This is fun. I, I would never have thought to do this. So Yay. I've got the slideshow ready and um, I'm just gonna, just gonna begin. Okay. So here I'll share my screen so that everyone can see. All right, 
So here's our first um, artifact, I guess it would be called. This is from 1826, and as far as I know, it's the oldest uh, piece that we have at the archives. Sorry, can I can I ask if it's actually working? Can you guys see this? Yes. Oh, good. There's no green box today. <laughs> it's just the normal screen. I don't know why. So anyway, this is this is from 1826, New York, and it's a sampler from Anne Wellman Beetle Dwight. When she was 13 years old, she made this as sort of a mm, cumulative piece to her education. Samplers were typically used that way by teenage girls to show what they learned in, in uh, uh, embroidery and sewing and things like that. And then it's passed down generation to generation. So this is still at the Johnson Farm today here. And it's, we're really lucky to have it. I can't believe that it's here from over, oh, well, almost 100, no, yeah, 200 years. I didn't even know what a sampler was, so this was educational. Still in New York, these are some interior photos of 58 West 3rd Street in Oswego, New York. I wanted to give you an idea of like what the interiors of the houses, some of some types of houses look like. And these were taken in 1902 at the Beetle residence. The house was built in 1860 but it's still there today if you want to see it you can go on the internet and look up 58 west third street oswego new york and see how it looks today with all of its remodeling and modern appliances but the structure and a lot of the fixtures the woodworking the stairs are all the same you can see the chandelier as well <laughs> So this looks like the underdog of the collection to me. It's, <laughs> it's still one of my favorites. It's from 1874, and this is a geography assignment that Rachel Johnson did as a schoolgirl when she was 14, living in Indiana. And I just love that um, it, it just looks like kids' homework that you would see today with colors, like coloring in squeezing in that text into these small spaces. I don't know. I just, I was really excited when I found it, even though it's dog-eared and has some water damage, looks like. That's a fantastic find, too. That's brilliant. <laughs> this is a portrait of Philip Kessler from the late 1800s. And you, you might be familiar with Kessler Mountain or Mount Kessler. If you've gone there to hike or mountain bike or enjoyed the sports facilities at the new Kessler Mountain Regional Park, this is the man that the mountain was named after. And Philip Kessler's portrait was donated to us at the archives by his descendant, Howard and Marianne Sapp Ray. These folks are descended from uh, the Reefs Chapel Pioneer community here. We were really excited to get this because we didn't have anything from Philip Kessler. Now we're going into Missouri for a short time. And I wanted to share with you all the Everton, Missouri BF Johnson cash store. And I love this photo because it gives not only the store, but a little bit about like the street scene and the horses tethered there and just the people milling about there in the front of the store. Um, it's, it was just really neat. And this is from the late 1800s, turn of the century, early 1900s. So um, if you're doing genealogy, preservation, and research of your own family's materials, here's a plug for digitizing it. <laughs> when you scan things in at high resolution, say 300 or 600 DPI or even higher, you can do things like this. You can crop and zoom in and see the faces of the people. And here we can see 
what some of the things they were selling at the Everton, Missouri cash store. This is B.F. Johnson, the owner, and his daughter. Again, we can see B.F. Johnson in the middle with his son in the background. And I'm not going to introduce everybody in all of these photos. There's a lot of people we'd be here all day. <laughs> but um, there's a lot more that I could say that I'd love to share with you. So if you do have questions, just get in touch with me at the links. This is still in Everton, Missouri. This is Wilton, the son of B.F. Johnson. And he's got what looks like a cow or maybe a young cow. Oh. <laughs> he was really tiny. Now we're in Arkansas. This is five miles southwest of Fayetteville. And um, we're at the B.F. Johnson pear orchard. You can see B.F. Johnson up there in the the pear tree on the ladder, and some of his family and workers with the barrels of pears below. This was taken on September 22nd, 1909. Here's an example of one of the many diaries or journals or, or whatever you want to call them, like daily activity logs that we have. There are a lot of these in the archives, and basically they just describe some of the, the work that people did day to day and all of the fun they, they may have had. Um, so for instance, sewed oats. Um, went to town, sold apples. There's a lot of Sunday school church mentions. Also the card game Rook. <laughs> I, played. Uh, I don't know if I forgot to mention this. This is Wayne Johnson's 1912 diary. So Wayne was a teenager when he was writing all of this and doing these activities. So the, the neighborhood teenagers at Reese Chapel community would get together and play cards and go to see movies and go to Sunday school and church and stuff together. I would say this is probably my favorite photo in, in the archives. Period. <laughs> I love it. Um, this is B.F. Johnson's youngest son, Benjamin Franklin Johnson III, with the three mules, Bird, Pete, and Bell. Bird and Bell are the white ones on the edges there, who uh, went to World War I with uh, Ben's brothers, Wilton and Wayne. You can read more about that story in the article and flashback if you want. Here's just an example. I wanted to share one of the many receipts that we have. So the archives isn't just the photos and letters and diaries. It's also just a lot of tidbits like this. This is a 1911 receipt for the purchase of the first telephone that was installed in the neighborhood. So uh, I think anybody in the community could use it. It was a party line telephone. And now I'm just gonna go through some more fun scenes. These guys are plowing near some peach trees at the Johnson Farm. Here they're making apple butter. You can see the cider press in the background. Don't you know that was nice and cool? <laughs> what was nice and cool? <laughs> Out there and in the fire making the apple butter and all, all of the dresses and everything. <laughs> I know, it must have been so hot. I don't know how they avoided chiggers. I thought that very same thing when you showed the one about them picking pears. <laughs> but <laughs> <takes pears. Woo. clears throat> Here's an example of one of the many hundreds of letters that we have from all over the world and different states in the country and particularly from Arkansas from the Johnson family. Um, this particular letter is from 1912. And it's from B.F. Johnson to his daughter, Ava. Dear daughter, I received your letter on May 6th in due time and was glad to hear from you. I'm glad to get the check for the $50. I have just finished spraying the orchard. It took us six days to spray the orchard. 
We use 600 pounds of sulfur and the same amount of wine and 150 pounds of arsenic of lead. We gave it the best spraying it has ever had since I have owned it. We used Lieutenant Ellis's sprayer. He ran the engine and we done the spraying. We have the best prospect we have had yet for apples. The prospect is good for pears. We expect to have two or three acres of sweet potatoes for seed. Have four or five thousand sweet potato foot spring to set now, but it is raining this morning. We have not planted much corn yet on account of summer rain. Strawberries are beginning to ripen here. We are having plenty of onions, lettuce, and radishes grown in our garden. We'll have new potatoes in about two weeks with nothing happens to them. With love and good wishes, I am your father, C.F. Calvin. <laughs> It's so sweet. That was a recording generously done by Tony Wapple, former archivist at the Washington County Courthouse, now the current archivist here at the Johnson Farm Archives. He's done he's such an amazing job. I can't say enough like how fascinated I am <laughs> by how he's been able to organize this. This is Tony at left in the archives with Ann Johnson Pritchard, who owns the farm and property and is one of the stewards. She calls herself a steward. And she's done an amazing job just preserving all of these records from generations of her family and maintaining the buildings as well. So this is like a behind the scenes look. <laughs> you can see what it's really like. That is amazing. That's already a lot, a lot archived. That's incredible. Yeah, and the collection they're with is the Beetle, the Beetle Collection of New York. So that's just one set. Oh, the journal. Okay, so this is B.F. Johnson's journal from 1920 through 1924. I was so excited when I found this in the boxes when we were going through them. <laughs> this was like one of the first. I didn't realize there were dozens of diaries. This was early on. And I just got so excited. I thought it was like the find of the century. <laughs> but um, it's, it's still pretty cool. He identified as being from Reef Chapel, Arkansas in Washington County, five miles southwest of Fayetteville, Arkansas. So um, that was like his address. So people would know generally where his farm was. And it's just, and this journal talks about various things, mostly the weather, agricultural prospects, and things like that, and some travel. It talks about how he bought his first automobile and how they went motoring. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful that they thought to write everything down? Such a blessing. Oh, it really is. Here's a postcard I thought was cool. We get a lot of postcards in general from different um, decades, but this one is neat because this little envelope here, this is, a, this is a real little tiny envelope and there's a real little letter in there. I thought that was so cool. This is one of the collections of memorabilia. In this case, it's from Wayne Johnson before he died in World War I. He uh, had a good time as a teenager going to the Ozark Theater with his friends, the neighborhood boys and girls. So you can see uh, they wrote on it like the date that they attended the, the show or movie and the people who went. So for instance, on October 4th, 1912, they saw St. Elmo. Now I'm going to share a little uh, collection from the Reese Chapel and school collection that we have, which is probably my like mm, favorite collection of all of them. I don't know why I have a thing for schoolhouses <laughs> and like old old one room schoolhouses and the way they did things back then. I don't know what year this was taken, but this is the Reese Chapel building. Um, you can see the sign here, Reef's Chapel, that confirmed for us the spelling that was appropriate for it. And also, you can barely make out the 12. It was district number 12 school. 
Here's a picture of the class. <laughs> there are a lot of class pictures if you want to see more of them. The library also has some in the Washington County School Days, School Days book. I was also, also going to mention that if anybody else had uh, or was enamored with um, old one room schoolhouses, we also have a book that's just, um, I think it's called Pinhole Photos of One yeah. Room Schoolhouses. That's pretty, pretty neat to go through too. What does that sound mean? Is that okay? Are we still recording? Yeah, sorry, that was me. <laughs> That was something coming in online. Is there a way that you can see that we are recording for sure? Yes, it's a uh, red recording. It's yeah. up at the top on mine. Oh, good, because I, I see nothing but the slideshow. <laughs> so that's good. I just did not want to do another one. <laughs> not recording this, so good. Okay, here's an artifact from the schoolhouse uh, from one of the students, Ben Johnson III. This was his slate that he actually did use, and his slate pencils here. These were the lead pencils um, wrapped in paper, and I was surprised to see this would have been 1908, 1910s, early 1910s, and they're wrapped in this paper that has the American flag on it. This is one of the um, documents that we've got on Reese Chapel School number 12. This is the teacher's book. Alta Kate was the teacher from 1926 to 1927 school year. And in this book, we've got all these different, you know, facts about the school. Here was their daily schedule of all their classes and when they had recess. And a lot of information about the students for that year their names and their family farm and whether they've been vaccinated and their birthdays and there's a lot of good information for people seeking information about their ancestors that may have like, lived here. So. Now we're leaving Arkansas and going on a trip around the world with Ava and Lenora Johnson. These sisters just decided they were going to do it. 1928, doesn't matter, traveling alone as women, doesn't matter, they're gonna just go around the world. <laughs> I was so impressed with them when I saw this. Uh, they, they've got a, a nice sized collection from their travels. Um, so I'm gonna share some of that with you now. We'll have to do another one of these around the world with the Johnson sisters. <laughs> I would so love to do that. Yeah, there's a lot more material, stickers even, like luggage stickers and stuff. That's great. They saved a lot. So this was one of their trip journals. That they, they, There's two journals from the trip. And I was pretty excited to find these and, and find out like more about what they actually saw and experienced. To see once is better than to hear a hundred times. So said Menzius. And with this idea in mind, my sister and I set sail this morning at 11 o'clock on the President Jackson for around the world trip. My dear friend, Mrs. Woodruff, together with her genial brother, Dr. Rowe, and his happy wife, were at Pier 132 Terminal Island, Long Beach, California, to fit us bon voyage. Wearing our little bonnets of ferns, lily of the valley clustering around a pink rosebud which Mrs. Rowe gave us, we stood on the deck as our steamer slipped out of its moorings on its way across the Pacific. It was intensely interesting to see the steamer set sail. I shall never forget our departure this morning. Mrs. Woodruff followed our steamer to the end of the pier and stood there waving her handkerchief till we were well out of the harbor. Then we went down to unpack, for we were not to leave the boat until we reached Yokohama February 6th. I soon discovered that Mrs. Woodruff, in her characteristic quiet way, has left behind an attractive box of nuts for us to enjoy. Here's Ava and Lenora riding camels in Egypt, and you can see the pyramids kind of in the background. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> These sisters were such characters. It was, it was really great to learn about them. 
here's a, a scene from Venice, and Lenora is there feeding the pigeons in front of St. Mark. Here's Ava in Singapore, kind of in a street scene. This is at the Palace of Amber, India, where the two sisters are going on an elephant ride. I think it's just as interesting to see all of the people around the world, like snapshots of their daily life too, and not just the sisters travel. Agreed. I was just thinking that that gentleman on the left must have just got done pulling the ladder from the elephant uh, after they'd gotten up there. Yeah. Yeah, people worked hard for, and they still do, for tourism. Yeah, so cool. This is in China, in Shanghai, at the street scene that the sisters experienced. They went to so many countries. I don't even remember the total number, but um, it seemed to me like most of the countries that I know. <laughs> so I'm sure they missed a lot of them, but they just went so many places. Here's England in Stratford. This is Anne Hathaway's cottage. It was a Model T car. Yeah. <laughs> so now we're going to go back to Arkansas and go back to the Johnson Farm in the 30s now. This is 1939 and the pergola that we're seeing here was just finished being constructed by um, Ava and Lenore's little brother, Benjamin Franklin Johnson III. He also traveled around the world. Uh, when he was a student at Harvard, he got a scholarship to study landscape architecture in the Mediterranean region. He went to Egypt and many countries around the Mediterranean to study their architecture, and it inspired him to build this pergola for his family farm to be able to grow grapes and wisteria, and I, I believe they put rose bushes there by the pillars in some decades. And today it's still in use. It's being grown, it's used to grow uh, wisteria, those beautiful purple flowers that trail down. And uh, of course the beams have to be replaced every once in a while as they deteriorate. And I think it's been replaced at least once, if not twice. This is the Johnson Barn, pictured in 1936. It was constructed in 1933. After the first barn uh, collapsed from a really heavy snowfall in the spring, they built a new one that was kind of a composite of a bunch of different barn styles. There's lots of information on the barn. It's on, been on PBS been photographed by professional photographers. So if you want to know more, definitely reach out and I can send you. Wasn't it, it's like the first of its kind, right? Yeah. After the hodgepodge, the different, and then isn't it also listed as a, didn't you help uh, get it listed as a historic building? Oh yeah, so um, I didn't help with this particular barn registration because that happened in 1990 and uh, the farm, like the entire Johnson farm, orchards, farmhouse, and outbuildings were listed as a district on the National Register as well, like in recently, <laughs> I forget what date, in recent years. And I helped with that. I worked with Holly Hope, who did a wonderful job compiling the nomination um, and driving up here from Little Rock. It looks extremely large. It is, it's really big. This is the barn again in 1968. And you can see the hay bales are uh, waiting to be lifted into the loft via this motorized elevator. Summercorn Foods 
was one of the people who sold products from the Johnson farm. This was one of the labels for the jars for organic ginger pear sauce. You can see the artwork better zoomed in and there's the Johnson barn. So I didn't know they were big into listing organic even back then. Yeah, I think this was from like the 70s. And this is the last thing I have to share. <laughs> Just for fun. I don't have a lot to say about this, but Razorback Apples, Arkansas flavor. It's kind of just a silly, interesting find that's familiar. I think the Razorbacks are familiar to a lot of people. And this, this particular piece of stationery is from Cook Orchards. They were the neighboring orchard next to the Johnson Farm orchards. And it's, it's interesting, too, because uh, if, you know, this, this is more modern, I guess. <laughs> Not maybe not during my generation, but more modern and everything that we're preserving today in our families, in our family story, is going to be history at some point. So the more we can preserve, the better to make those bridges with the past and the future. Did that's you, all I have. <laughs> you talked about um, how important it is to digitize. Uh, did you use a hand scanner or these photographs, or how did you go about? How do you go about archiving these? Um, I just use a digital flatbed scanner and do it by hand. I, is that what you're asking? Oh, maybe maybe yeah. you mean yeah. if it's a hand like a wand scanner. No, I have dreams of getting grants and like getting much more sophisticated scanning technology because. Like I said, there's hundreds of letters and there's so many, so many photographs that I haven't scanned yet. Well, we might, this all on the we might just have to make a suggestion that that could be something that you could check out from your local library. So we'll see what we can do about that. Really? That would be so cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I've actually used the library scanner, not for, not for archives, but I've used it for my artwork before I had a scanner. So that's another idea if you if you are watching this and you've got like a folder or a couple folders of photographs of your family that you want to preserve the art the uh, library has a scanner right? Right. We hope we hope to get one uh, especially for genealogy if possible so that would be helpful for us. Well, that was fantastic, Amanda. That was, that's great. It was great. Yes, of course. I knew it would be. And you said if they had any questions, they could go uh, where and find out more? Oh, you could go to the links that linked in the video description of our website, um, either our website, ripplesblog.org, R-I-P-P-L-E-S blog.org, or makeripples.org. Okay. Um, or you could just get, get in touch with us on our Facebook page. I think our Facebook page, Facebook address is like Ripple's blog, but we'll link to it and so that people can just click there. Okay, but it's all under Ripple's. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah, you can see more of the historic photos there. It isn't really a history website, like you introduced it, right? Where it's just, there's a lot going on, right? With the ecological conservation angle and also the historic angle. So. But you can, you can see that eventually. Um, and Richard and Johnson Richard wants to have a website for these archives to be uploaded for people to see and browse to find things about their family or about the fruit industry. Um, so that'll be a part of it eventually <laughs> once we get time. <laughs> Yay! That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your hard work. It certainly is uh, interesting and I'm sure everyone will enjoy it. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a really great opportunity to share some of the things I get to see at my job in the archives. Fantastic. You have a wonderful job. Thanks. And if you want to just hit uh, the record button, that should stop it or pause it. You should be okay. okay. Thank you everybody for joining us and, and hope you have a good day. <laughs>